Hey everybody, welcome to Career Connections this week. Um, today we are actually meeting with somebody a little different, maybe a career path we hadn't considered before. Um, we are meeting with Martin Carball. For those that have seen a sign around know that he is the state rep for District 81. Um, so most of you actually live in that area if you're in that kind of that mid Fort Wayne range. Um, and he's just going to tell us today a little bit more just about what it's like to be in politics, what you have to consider to take that as, you know, take that career path, um, the education requirements. Um, if, and just as a reminder, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and just drop them in the chat box and we will ask them along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Carball to just introduce himself, tell us a little bit about um, what it's like to be in politics and how he got there. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Taylor. Um, so, like you said, I'm Martin Carbo. I represent a big part of Fort Wayne um, in the state house. Each district on the house side, because we have a house and senate, on the house side we represent one one hundredth of a, of the state. So, approximately ten years ago, when we did the census in 2010, they redistricted. I wasn't elected back then, um, but they redistricted everything so that all the districts had equal number of uh, population people living in it which is about 65,000. Well, my district has shifted and um, more people I think have moved in than moved out and there's been some new housing development. So I probably today represent closer to 70,000 people, um, but yet the state population is 67. So what you'll find is this year, one of the things we're gonna do is redistrict. So hopefully I get to keep all of you in the district, but uh, Anyway, um, we'll redraw the lines to make sure everybody represents one one hundredth of the state. So, um, you know, you asked uh, what it's like to be a state rep. Well, it can be a very rewarding and very frustrating type of job. Um, and uh, it's a very busy job. We are in Indiana, a part time legislature. So what that means is I have a regular um, normal job like anybody else. And then when we um, have session, then I go to Indianapolis. Um, during session, we're usually down there Monday through Thursday, and that starts uh, in January. And we'll go this year. We're scheduled to end at the end of April, although because of COVID, because what we anticipate will be kind of a difficult start and stop type of year if people start getting the virus. Um, we've been told that it would be best if we did not make any plans to be anywhere else uh, through, through maybe May and June. So we hope that doesn't happen. Um, but it could, and that's, that's also um, one of the features of being an elected representative. I'm your hired hand as your state representative. I'm down there casting votes on various bills that are going to affect the lives of all Hoosiers. Uh, but specifically when I'm down there voting, I'm thinking about how is it going to affect people like you and like me? And our neighbors and family and friends and so i bring my perspective and and my uh, background and and our shared interests here in fort wayne down to indianapolis and try to help make the best laws possible for us and for the entire state um i'm gonna look here in the corner i got my chat up and um there was a question here where is your office located do you get paid for your position good question um my office my state rep office is in indianapolis at the state house um, we do not um, have any local offices. You see that at the federal level where um, your congressman has district offices in different parts of his district. Uh, senators will have district offices. Um, your state representatives and state senators don't have local offices. Um, when people need to get a hold of me on, on state rep items, Typically, they'll call into my office in India, and I do have a full-time legislative assistant. My assistant has three different state representatives that he serves throughout the year, and uh, he, he fields those calls. I also get direct messages through social media. Uh, some people have my phone number from in the district and will give me a call, and uh, I try to help as much as possible, but I really do lean, again, being the part-time legislature, we lean on our staff, and we have amazing staff down there that help, <clears throat> excuse me, the constituents questions get solved much quicker than I could on my own. Um, they've got great relationships with different state um, organizations and state uh, departments um, and help connect, connect people with benefits. During the COVID, uh, the start of the COVID thing was right after session was over with this year. Um, we saw a huge influx, obviously, of unemployment. 
uh, people filing unemployment benefits. And so there were several cases of people who had reached out either directly to me or to my office, and we'd help them through with DWD, Department of Workforce Development, on how to get their unemployment benefits that they qualified for. And there was a couple of sticky situations that uh, kind of took me uh, stepping in and throwing a little bit of weight around to try to get uh, things figured out. We had some systems issues. You know, we went from processing a few thousand unemployment benefits in a, in a month to hundreds of thousands overnight. And so because we were at a point where we were only doing a certain amount, DWD to, your, to their credit to save taxpayer money, would low, they lowered their staff um, at, over time because we had such low unemployment. And then unemployment, boom, overnight just went way up. And so we had to hire a lot of people and then they were working from home and needing training. So it was a really, really tenuous time. I think we've, we've done as well as we could have um, uh, compared to other states. Um, and then do I get paid for my position? I do. So there is a salary associated with being a state rep. Um, it's, it's nothing you quit a job for. Um, uh, but uh, they do uh, provide some health insurance benefits, and retirement benefits. And then you get what they call a per diem when you're in session. Um, and the per diem as a daily amount, and it, it really all of our pay is tied to judges pay. They did that years ago in a budget. Um, and that per diem is to help us pay for expenses. Um, during session, I'm staying in a hotel every night I'm down in Indianapolis. So there's some expenses involved there that the per diem is there. I'm buying my own meals a lot of times. Um, sometimes others buy, but there, there's a, an acknowledgement that your expenses go up when you're in session and your ability to do your other regular work and ability to earn a living at home goes down. And so it's supposed to kind of be an offset there. Um, I can tell you over time, it's definitely more of a cost than a benefit, but uh, it's one that I, I really enjoy. So I've kind of blasted in here, answered a question. Uh, is there any other, what, what other things you want me to talk about, Taylor, that would be yeah. beneficial for folks? So first, you may, you may have mentioned this. I'm sorry if I missed that. How long have you been in office? I hadn't said that. Um, I first got elected in 2012. So um, I'm coming up on year number nine and 10 with this two year term. Um, so those, those of you that uh, are fond of term limits may say, oh, 10 years, you're going to keep going. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see about that. But, um, but yeah, this is, uh, uh, in the house, we have two year terms. And so when I just got reelected, that means two more years, um, of service. And then I reevaluate while you, the constituents reevaluate whether you'd want me or not. So. I would say if you made it through COVID year and still chose to run again, then you're, you're solid, you're locked in. <laughs> well, here's the deal. I didn't choose during COVID. We had to file before all this happened. Oh. <laughs> but I'm I didn't pull, I didn't pull out. Thing. I could have pulled out. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Okay, so that's an interesting point that I don't think a lot of people realize. You only do this a few months a year. I mean, obviously you're a state rep every day of the year, but you are right. in office for just a chunk of the year. And then the rest of the year you're doing something. I mean, or maybe not. Are you employed otherwise or what does that look like? Yeah, so, and it's, I'll, I'll speak for myself and give you an idea of some of the other folks uh, that I serve with around the state, what they do. But, um, you know, I'm 41 years old. I've got a, a full-time job not a career politician, don't want to be. Um, I've been a financial advisor and insurance advisor too since 2001. So I've continued to do that, continued to grow my business um, when I'm not in session. Don't do a ton of growing during session. Um, but there are a lot of folks down there at the state house that are retired. Um, some of our uh, more senior uh, members have gotten past their full career and this is a way for them to serve the community and give back. Um, there are a couple, I think, that kind of make this a little bit more of a full-time gig. I'll say those folks um, are located physically much closer to the state house. And so it's much easier to kind of find things to do all the time with this job uh, when you're a little closer in proximity to the state house, I think. But, you know, um, over the years, I've gotten involved with national organizations. There's a national council 
of insurance legislators that I'm a vice chair of a committee there. And um, I pushed, a, uh, they make model laws. So in other words, in this case, we passed a law in Indiana. I, I authored a bill to expand short-term health insurance and improve the benefits of those. Um, and I took that as a model to this national group. This national group is comprised of senators and representatives from all over the country that, that work on insurance issues. And that's why it's the National Council of Insurance Legislators. And so um, took my bill that we passed in Indiana to that group as here's something we should consider as a national model. And I'm excited to say this summer that passed. I attended the meeting via Zoom. So uh, one of the first uh, <laughs> Zoom passed uh, bills um, there. But anyway, that doesn't make law at those things, but that gives those senators and reps in other states where maybe they haven't changed their short-term plans a good um, starting point or uh, a blueprint on how, if we want to do this as a state, how can we do it? What's been successful elsewhere? And so those types of groups, and there are others I'm a part of, are a lot of fun to, to be a part of in that you get to learn about other states, how have they tackled similar problems that we've had, um, and maybe how have they tackled it, and maybe made some mistakes, and then we can avoid it. And then also, you know, what have we done that's maybe been a leader in the nation that we can then uh, have a, a bigger impact in, in our country? So those types of things, when you consider there's three of those meetings, uh, three per year, um, and they're usually three to four days travel across the country, different places. Um, so you've got those meetings that you can choose to get involved with. Um, now, granted, there's going to be interim study meetings within the state house. Uh, so topics sometimes come up during session that we don't have consensus on, but we all recognize it's something that we really should do a little more investigating, really should study some more, maybe take more testimony before we head down a path to change a law or create a law. And so they, they always call them summer study committees. They usually happen in the fall. Um, but I like to say, anytime you're not in session, it feels like summer. So, <laughs> um, so there's summer study committees. The whole idea is to study when we're not meeting passing laws, and um, you can you can dive deeper. You can take more testimony. You can ask more in-depth questions. You can hear from a lot more um, folks that are affected by whatever it is that you're studying. So, a lot of times, um, things come out of those meetings that then get filed as bills the next year. And um, that's where a lot, of, a lot of good laws come out of is those deeper dives. Uh, another thing I can say too, as far as many of the bills I've passed have come from conversations with constituents. Um, oftentimes, you know, your experience and your day-to-day -day life is gonna be different than mine, it's gonna be different than your neighbors. And those conversations about, you know, here's something that's kind of getting in the way of business or getting in the way of, you know, us personally that uh, the state could change Sometimes I don't even know about it until I hear about it from people. So I always encourage uh, communication on that. And uh, um, those are some of the most rewarding ones to kind of take a problem, maybe unknown uh, to many people, make it known, and then find a solution. Those are, those are good. Uh, I will good say that, you know, I work for Easter Seals Arc, obviously. And, you know, mm -hmm. we'll hear about bills and different things that are going through. And we're constantly encourage call your you know your rep call down to the state house you know let them know what you're thinking how this will benefit you as the people they're representing so absolutely know, that's definitely definitely true that you know you you listen you have to because you know you can't see the whole world and just what you see every day so um, that's exactly that's right and and i see that um and i know many of my colleagues do is is a, a requirement of the job um, actually, I find it a fun part of the job in not necessarily hearing how things are bad for people, uh, but, you know, what are some things that maybe I don't know about that I can work on? And um, some people will say, well, I don't want to bother you. It's not a bother. It's what you hire me to do. Um, I guess even whether you voted for me or not, <laughs> I am the hired guy by some people. Uh, and, um, you know, most people I talk to, unless they volunteer it right up front, I don't know if they voted for me or not. And I never ask. I don't. I don't necessarily care because I represent everyone, and um, really, um, really just enjoy learning about 
uh, everyone's situation. Um, I, I did notice a, a question popped up. Uh, do you have specialized committees you participate on? That's a great question. I do. Um, we all do. Uh, typically, we're assigned to two to three committees. Every now and again, you'll have a rep that's on four. Um, I am chair of the Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee. Um, and that's kind of new in that I've been chair of insurance, the insurance committee for the last um, four or five years now, I believe. Um, but this year they're combining the financial institutions committee with insurance. And I was made the chair of that. So that's kind of a, an extra uh, neat um, responsibility I'll have. That, that just means I'll have more bills assigned to me and uh, more decisions to make. Um, and then I sit on two other committees. I sit newly this year for the first time, I'll be on the education committee. And I also sit on employment, labor and pensions committee. And with my work um, in my regular life, financial advising and working with many people with their uh, financial plans, I've, I've run across a lot of state pensions and really came into the job the first time I got elected. I knew a lot about the state pension. And what's interesting, again, it's a part-time legislature. People have jobs all over the state, many different areas. Um, a lot of people say, oh, they're all attorneys. Actually, there's very few attorneys in the state house anymore. Um, but um, uh, my experience with the pensions, I realized my first year after hearing some pension bills and kind of naturally understanding what the topics were and then hearing some of the questions other people's had, I realized I knew a lot more about pensions than most people elected down there and I was a freshman. <laughs> so what's, what's interesting, other people that have been elected for a while picked up on that too. And early in my um, service, I had a couple of senior members say, you know, they complimented me on knowing it and say, you know, you ought to really think about making that a part of your focus while you're down here because you, you can really add a lot of value. And so I have carried a lot of pension bills uh, as a result of that. And um, I'm not, this is not going to be the typical politician take all the credit, but I will say Indiana as a whole, and it started way before me, our pension system is very well funded. It's very secure. Um, I think we've done a really nice job of balancing, providing benefits and managing it to a point where we can deliver on those promises. We always, we always point to Illinois as kind of the example of what not to do in a lot of areas because financially they're, they are in debt in their pension to a larger amount than what our pension is in size. They're, they're well over $60 billion in debt. So a lot of the pensioners over there are concerned are these promises even going to be met on a long-term basis so we never want to be in that position in indiana and um I'm, I'm happy to say that we've really made it a priority to do that so employment labor and pensions um uh education for the first time this year and chair of insurance and financial institutions Let's back way up here. So like I mentioned, whenever we had first set this up, this room consists of people all in all different phases of kind of that employment, what's what's next. Um, some are just thinking about employment, some are, you know, asking more questions, getting involved, feeling around, and some are work ready now. But whenever you first started, what does it take, like way back at the beginning, what does it take to be in politics? What type of education requirements, experience? Um, and then what made you qualified to run, I guess? It's a great um, question and one I get quite often and people are normally surprised by the answer. There, um, you have to be 21 years old. That's it. <laughs> There truly is no other qualification um, needed. Now, obviously, um, you're going to have to um, convey your message and who you are and be somebody that people want to vote for. Um, they're going to want to know. And that's it's true in a lot of things in life. I think people care more about who you are rather than what you've done um, because it's the value system in which you make decisions that really matters um, when it comes to a lot of things at the state house. It's not stuff I've dealt with on a day to day basis. I always say sewer districts are something I never heard of really <laughs> until I became a state representative. And, um, you know, pe people, I think, understand that 
there's a lot of topics you're not gonna know. So you develop relationships with people that you know have worked in those areas and you build a trust there. Um, and then I can just tell you, having been a constituent and not elected just eight years ago, it was, it, I always wanted to know the value system. Um, what makes that person tick? What's important to them from an issue standpoint, but also uh, just from a moral and ethical standpoint. I think that's probably the biggest thing is being able to do the work, um, meet the voters. I've knocked on thousands and thousands and thousands of doors talking to voters over the years, uh, and even just this year. year. I'm sorry? Probably less this year. <laughs> no, actually, actually, I probably knocked on more doors this year than since my first election. But I was masked up the whole time. And I tried to stay away from the door. Uh, we, we did. We tried to keep keep it very smart. I had a lot of people very, very thankful for me stopping, saying it's the first time they'd seen anybody. Um, and those interactions help people understand who you are past the commercials. You know, I had some people say, well, I, I really liked your commercials. Um, but really, I mean, I can like somebody's commercial, but it doesn't mean I've met them or know them at all. And so the key thing for anybody thinking about being in politics is, you know, um, help other people that you like run for office. That actually you learn a lot on how to run for office when you help others that you, you believe in. Uh, and then just find the position that you think you might be able to add the most value. It doesn't have to be state rep. Uh, it could be a city council, county council, it could be a school board position, which isn't even a partisan position. Um, there's so many ways to operate in the community. And then the other thing I wanted to um, make a point too um, is that being in politics elected is one thing. You can be in politics and still add a lot of value and, um, and help a lot of people in the community by being a part of staffs. You know, you've got your local city and county councils. You've got state government, federal government. Um, you know, Congressman Banks has a local office in Fort Wayne, and he has got um, a staff of people that help constituents. And, and oftentimes, I'll have constituents, they'll know me, and they'll say, hey, I've got the, I had a friend I hadn't talked to in years, really, called me a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you know, the situation, and it was a social security situation. It wasn't, that's federal. So I said, well, I don't know that there's a lot we can do, but I'm going to have my legislative assistant reach out to you and give them a little bit of the background. And then we'll connect you up with Congressman Bank's office, Senator Todd Young's office, and see if there isn't something that we can help you out with. So those people that aren't elected but serve on those, those different um, offices, they provide an invaluable um, service to the community by how they're able to help the constituents. Um, so there is a, there's a lot, and then, you know, lobbyists get a really bad name and there are bad lobbyists, but all lobbying means is you are lobbying or you are encouraging elected representatives to do something for a group of interested people. And so, you know, there are people down there that, um, that I get along with really well that uh, have the interests of Easter Seals Arc uh, in mind when they talk to me. Um, what you find with, with in the lobbying community is there's some really good people that are there representing their clients because their client, you know, Taylor can't come down to the state house and talk to me about what Easter Seals Arc wants. She's busy working. She's busy doing the work. So you have to have that person that understands what, what uh, Taylor and all the others at Easter Seals are doing in the community to explain it to me so that I can understand when I'm voting on a bill that's going to affect Easter Seals, this is what the this is what the possible ramifications are. So there's so many different ways of being involved in government and making an impact in the community that doesn't involve running for office, um, but can be just as or more impactful, but just depending. Just picking up the phone and calling, it does make a difference. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. We. We don't get a ton of calls. I mean, if we get a hot button issue, of course we will on that issue. Um, but, um, you know, I find out if, if, if I'm not at the state house, my legislative assistant will let me know if people call and have an issue. And then I'll reach out if it's something I need to be involved in. Um, a lot of times they can take it, but um, yeah, we get, we get notified of that. And for those that can, the in-person 
uh, meeting is, is really good. Now that's obviously really difficult these days. Um, but even setting up Zoom meetings and such is, is uh, sometimes possible depending upon schedule. Okay, so some of the more broad employment questions that we just usually ask whenever we're talking to employers. Uh, well, number one, what's your favorite part of what you do in politics or as the state rep? Not campaigning, I can tell you that. <laughs> no, part, actually part of the campaigning I really like, it's just the time commitment to it. Um, now, the thing I really do enjoy is the um, community help, the, the, the ability to take someone in a rough situation because they can't navigate some of these government systems and help help them get any benefits that are required or not required that they qualify for um, and, and to help bad situations turn into good situations. Um, um, you know, sometimes what we do down there seems kind of tedious at times, but um, almost every one of the bills that we pass, it's going to mean something to somebody. And so um, that, that service aspect of it is, is really the thing that I enjoy the most. Yeah, I was just explaining that to somebody earlier today. You know, the higher up you go, you don't get to see everybody and talk to everybody day to day, but you know, you're affecting things on the larger scale. So, you know, you, you, you don't get to do the, the, the fun parts as much, but you still get to have that positive impact. And, you know, that kind of makes things worth it. So, yeah. And then on the flip side of that, and I feel like I might know the answer to this already, just because I've, I've seen some of the campaigning and some of the commercials and yeah, what's, what's your least favorite part of this, of, of being a state rep? That, <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, I, I had, um, I had a especially contentious race this year and, um, the tough part, I mean, I can, I'm a big boy. I can handle it. I mean, the, the, negative stuff that was out there was either a mischaracterization or a lie. I can handle that. I, I met enough people on the doorstep. They understood that that was the case as well. I think that's why I won, but, um, but seeing what that does to the family, I know it, it frustrated the heck out of, uh, my wife and it, me at the end, by the end. Um, but, um, kept the kids mostly away from it. Uh, we don't, we don't watch a ton of the local TV with them. Um, uh, but then what, what was interesting is I, I do a lot, part, part of my business, I do uh, health insurance and help seniors and folks that are on Medicare or Medicare and Medicaid sign up for um, insurance. And that season starts October 15th and goes to December 7th. Well, right in the middle of that's an election. <laughs> so um, it was really interesting during and especially after the election, I would meet people and many, many live in the district. So they're also constituents. They come in and they were like, man, I got so mad at that TV when I saw these negative ads. And, uh, I, you know, I kind of laughed it off and said, yeah, it's just, you know, it is what it is. I guess it's a part of it. Unfortunately, it's a part of it. Um, but, um, I tried to stay above that and, uh, and that worked out, but, that's probably the least favorite is just how the whole job of, can affect family. Probably closely second to that is the time away from family. Um, and that, that's yeah. where every two years, it, I think for some people, it seems like it's such an easy decision. Oh, you just keep running if you win, right? But it, it really is a, a thoughtful decision every two years. Do we want to do have another to send your way for a couple months at a time and you have kids so that exactly that would be a hard choice definitely i mean i get to come home i come home thursday nights and i've got three-day weekends friday saturday sunday but then right back down on monday so um it's it's tough and and the kids are getting older and they're they're understanding it more and thankfully they're missing me they're not excited about me leaving <laughs> I, I totally get that. I have a parent who does the same thing, goes away five days a week, comes back on the weekends and tries to get five days in in two days and does it again. Yeah. It's worth, it's worth the cause. It's worth what they're doing it for. So, all right. And then just kind of, um, it's a very normal question for these career connections usually, but for this, it's a little different. What about a uniform? Could I like be a state rep and show up in my pajamas and that would be like a okay. Or what does that look like? <laughs> It, it would not be. It would be frowned upon, uh, depending how fancy your pajamas are, maybe. But uh, 
Um, so for the House chamber and the Senate chamber, they have certain rules and they're, they're rules that can be changed. Um, they're adopted prior to session starting. Um, but um, men have to wear a tie and have a jacket on, on the floor. Um, there are actual and, requirements of this is what must be worn. Right, right. So um, some people kind of stretch that with their uh, zaniness of ties, I guess, and things like that. But mostly it's, it's mostly professional. And then um, for women, it's a little less descriptive. We don't make women wear ties. Um, but basically, you know, no jeans, you know, no T-shirts, no sweatshirts. It's, it's, a, it's a pro supposed to be a professional look. I would probably um, so. be the person that showed up in the hot pink blazer. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, let's see. I had another thought here. And I think it has escaped me. If I were going to, all right, I, I've decided I want to be a state rep. You've convinced me. How do I apply? There just, Good question. You know, so, yeah, yep, you have to file. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, don't do that. It's probably a scam. Um, now you have to um, you have to sign up um, with the Secretary of State. So um, you know it's usually during session when the filing deadline is. So I sign up while I'm in session. But the first time I remember took a trip down from Fort Wayne all the way down to the State House and um, uh, went to the Secretary of State's office, indicated you know showed my driver's license, told them where I live, filled out the form, submit it. That's it. That's um, it. That's it. Yeah. And then, and then now, get your things, name out there or that's right. I mean, um, to be on the ballot, that's really all you need to do. Um, some offices, as you go higher, require signatures. You know, you have to have so many people sign to say that, yes, we want them on the ballot or her on the ballot. But uh, state rep, it's really just go down and indicate you want to run. And there's now there's some more complication to it. If you want to raise money to advertise and to put your name out there, then you have to form a political action committee, file that, do regular filings um, on that to make sure, you know, there's just disclosures galore when it comes to that, you know, where are you getting your money? What are you spending it on? Um, there are some restrictions. Uh, every state is different too. That's something you have to take a look at no matter what state you're in. Um, you have to take a look at what their rules are for that, what you can spend it on what the disclosures are. You know, if you guys ever notice, there's a little thing at the bottom paid for and authorized by, you know, votecarball.com is the name of my committee. I, I just use my website as the uh, name of the committee. A lot of people's, it's like friends of Martin Carbaugh. But um, anyway, uh, that you have to do reports, but if you don't have that disclosure on your items, save for a couple of exceptions, um, then that's a violation. You could pay a penalty for that. You could pay a fine. So the whole idea when they passed a lot of those laws is they want folks to know who is paying for what so that, you know, is this, is this some, is this some side group that's putting all the money in to the, in, in, into the campaign by paying for all the signs and stuff, or is this being paid for by the committee? And then if it's being paid for by the committee, you can go and look, well, where does the committee raise their money? What, where have they gotten their financial backing? And so it's all about just being transparent and, and open, which I think is the most important. Um, a lot of people will talk about, oh, I just wish we could get money out of politics, you know, with all the advertising and all that obscene amount of money spent. Um, so the problem is Supreme Court said that's not really the case, that money is speech. So that's just not feasible. Uh, it's not, not going to happen. I think it's most important to have disclosure more than limits. Um, if, if you know where stuff is coming, I think that's more important than limiting. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I, so for instance, when I ran the first time, I, there was a couple of groups. There was a group called Americans for Prosperity. And then there's the um, Indiana Family Institute. They ran, they put out, I think they each did three or four mailers, either against my opponent or for me, but they, I didn't know about it until they were in the mailbox. They didn't consult with me. They're not allowed to, first of all. 
And I can tell you some of the stuff they put on there, I don't, I think I agreed with most of it, but I don't know that that would have been my first message uh, to people, but that's what they were putting out there. So as a candidate, I'd much rather that have, that I have control on what the messaging is. So sometimes when you see, and, and you have to look to some of the nasty TV commercials, you have to look and see who paid for them. So um, sometimes there's some really nasty ones and then it's like some side group you've never heard of. And there are times where a, a candidate gets blamed for all the negative ads. They're not, it's not up to them. It's, 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 uh, it's this other group that's doing it on their own. So um, kind of went down a, a, a tangent there, but it's interesting, the money side of politics and how it all works. That's an important piece. I mean, if you're going to get into it, you really got to know what you're getting into. And while making the difference, certainly, um, I think is a positive thing. And probably the main reason most people get into it, you have to know the good, the bad, and the ugly that goes with it. Because once you're in, you're in. Like if you decided of June of next year, all right, nuts to this, I'm out. <laughs> Could you do that? Or would you have to stick out your two terms? Or I mean, what would that look no. like? No, you can you can um, you can quit any time. It's it's frowned upon if you've made a commitment for two years. But there can be reasons, you know. Um, there could be a death in the family, and it's just not feasible for you to be gone three, four, five months out of the year. Um, lots of things can pop up. If that happens, then um, the way we do it in Indiana. So let's say I would resign in June, like you said. That's not the plan. I know this is being recorded. <laughs> um, but let's say I did, and um, what then happens is all the party that I, I'm affiliated with, their representatives that live in my district that represent precincts, which precincts are just little areas of, of the different parts of the town, anybody who lives in or represents precincts in my district, they would get together, there'd be a period for people to file they would have a caucus, a political caucus, and then anybody who lives in my district could run in that caucus. And those precinct committeemen choose who would be my successor. So this just happened recently, um, shortly after the election. Um, it was up, um, I can't remember the district number, but um, many of us will remember Marlon Stutzman as our congressman. Well, he was, uh, he was before Jim Banks. So he, um, he was also a state rep and a senator prior to that. Well, his wife, uh, two years ago, got elected to be a state representative up in their area. It's north of here um, for the first time. And Christy did a great job her first two years, and she ran one reelection. And she's had, they, they bought Amish acres, and things with all the shutdowns and all that have been very tight and difficult in their business life. And so with no end in sight to that. Um, she she had po made a post on Facebook about I I just I can't. She owes it to her employees and the business and all that and her family to spend more time on that and don't have the does not now have the time to dedicate and do a good job for the people who she's supposed to represent. So she resigned and just recently a, a lady by the name of Joanna King won that caucus and so now she'll become a state representative for two years and um but then we'll be up for re-election in 2022. and then just real quick just because you know i want to respect everybody's time um what does a normal day in session look like i mean what would that job look like for me come session if you were a state rep well um that's a really interesting question this year <laughs> Uh, being um, being COVID because everything's going to change. But your typical, no, well, first of all, there isn't any typical day uh, in Indy because you have meetings that can kind of happen at all different times. Um, committees meet. They have a regular basis of when they meet. Uh, so for me, I'm going to just give you a little bit of what last year was like. Last year, session starts on Monday at 1.30. And so I would get up pack, head down to Indy in time for session. We would do session, which is when we hear resolutions, listen to bills, hand down bill lists, all that kind of stuff, and pass things out to the Senate. And then once session's over with, 
you're on your own until the next day. Um, Tuesday sessions typically at 1.30. Um, now some may say, well, why don't you start earlier and get done earlier? Well, they account, they leave it, um, the mornings open for uh, committees. Um, so a lot of times committees meet on Mondays, Tuesdays, and then Wednesday is just a committee day. The whole day is committees. Thursday sessions at 10 a.m. And that's more of an acknowledgement that many people are gonna travel home on Thursday for the weekend. And so we wanna start earlier, end earlier in order to get people home uh, before it gets too late on Thursday. Um, but each day could be different. You could have, we could have a day where the labor committee is not gonna meet and um, sessions at 1.30. So I don't have anything to do from a meeting standpoint until 1.30. That's not very often. Um, most of the time, if you're not meeting in a committee or in a session, you're meeting with other people about bills you're working on. And so then that's really sporadic. Um, and so you may meet, meet people for dinner because of that, because of timing, breakfast, lunch. There's usually meals uh, are good times to meet because everybody's got to eat anyway. Um, and that's a good time to discuss things, but um, it's kind of throughout the day. Now this year, they're talking about having um, much less um, session days um, so that we can have more committee days, not necessarily to hear more bills and pass more laws, but we're only going to have two committee rooms where normally we'd have four or five. And so we, we need more days to accommodate more times um, for committees to meet. So it, this year is going to be a very interesting year um, when it comes to how everything works. And then if enough people get COVID or we have support staff called LSA or Legislative Services Agency, LSA writes all the bills. They write it in Indiana code language. I mean, if you read our code books, it's not how you and I talk, um, but it's very consistent. And we've actually won national awards with how consistent our laws are written and understandable and, and easier to litigate. Um, and protect people at the same time. Um, there are some states, it's no, I mean, I'm a citizen legislator and I sit down on a scratch pad, write up the bill and that's what we consider. Um, and it gets put in the law books, just like how I wrote it down, unless somebody, you know, votes to change it not. And it's very, it becomes very difficult uh, from a legal standpoint to uphold laws or challenge laws just because of the, the way it is. So Indiana's blessed and have an LSA. Um, but you know, if, if a series of those attorneys, which every meeting has an LSA assigned attorney, um, if they get COVID and they're down and not able to zoom in, um, we may end up shut down for a little bit. That's why they're saying. You can't you know, do it like how they've been doing the, the sports events and just everybody have like a cutout in the state house and then and you just zoom in or no? <laughs> yeah, pumped in crowd noise. No, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, I do see one chat question here too, Taylor, about do you have volunteer opportunities throughout the year? Sure. Um, there are... Um, there's not a ton necessarily outside of campaigning as far as what we look for for volunteers. Now, there is a program called the PAGE program that's designed for high school students, uh, younger students to go down and help our um, legislative assistants and help us on the floor and some of the things that we do. But all that's eliminated now because we're not doing resolutions. We're not having extra people that don't need to be there just out of abundance of caution. Well, you know, I'm sure there's a hundred more questions, um, but we are coming at the end of our time here. So I thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if I get any questions later on, I will definitely send them your way. If that's all right. Yeah. And it sounds like you might be joining us after session to maybe tell us a little bit more about insurance and financial planning. So we might be seeing you again. Um, yes, for sure. Thank you so much for joining us on this Festivus. Uh, <laughs> and you I had a politician on to air your grievances and I heard, hardly heard that's not a complaint but uh <laughs> didn't hear any grievances <laughs> that's, that's a good thing that means you're doing that's it right, right I think. um 
but thank you again. And I hope you and everybody on the call has a wonderful holiday. All right. Yep. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.